What's up, folks? I should actually not be making this video right now. I'm making this and it's taking precedent over all the other videos I have in the works right now. But I got some really exciting news just the other day that my channel just got approved for the community features on the YouTube app and just through YouTube in general. And those features are awesome for me interacting with you folks. And I took that opportunity to make that first post a questionnaire just asking you folks, do you see this? If you do see it, can you either just give it a like or comment down below with a question or just say, hey. I I essentially wanted like a real world case study to see how many people are indeed seeing this of the what like 6,000 of you that are here. It's also a way for me to see how can I provide even more value to you through that feature. I want to say it happened a few months back where YouTube subscribers actually surpassed Instagram followers and Instagram is amazing because there's so many ways that I can interact through questions and polls and just directly DMing you folks but with YouTube it's different. If I'm not putting out a whole video, a fully edited video, it's either like one-on-one -on -one responding in the comments or that's kind of it. There's no good way for me to get in touch with you, whether it's like a quick message or an update on something or even just ask something that's related to a YouTube video. I think it's weird that I have to go outside of YouTube, whether it's on Twitter or Instagram, to just ask a simple question. So now that I have it, definitely keep your eyes peeled for more of it. I really respect your opinion and I love, love, love hearing from you folks. That being said, as a sincere thank you for every single one of you that were so kind to respond, I want to kind of make this like an ask me anything and respond to all of your questions. Let us open this up, see what you folks are saying, and do my best. Stone Phillips says Japanese knives are overrated. I think with the amount of Japanese knives available, it's very easy to say that because when people see that something gets popular, it's very easy to make a knockoff. I grew up loving Japanese movies and kung fu and cartoons. It does hold a special place in my heart. And at a certain point, yeah, they're just pieces of metal, but I think the Japanese do some really, really nice stuff on the higher end and on the cheap end. Miguel asks, awesome, I'm gaining access to additional features. How am I planning on utilizing this? I'm not 100% sure. I think there's a feature where I can ask you folks polls. So that means like if I have a couple of videos in the works, maybe doing something where it's like, I wanna do these three videos, which one should I post next? And also, as I mentioned towards the beginning of the video, doing something like with the podcast, if I'm interviewing someone, I can poll you folks to see what you wanna ask them. And then also combine that with Instagram somehow because I can then tag that person on Instagram and their audience can come and ask their questions. And then even quickie updates. So like, for example, the guys at Sharp Ed Shop didn't have a discount code ready for me when I published the Bunka review. So now they do, and then I can share that video link with a thing in the description that says, here's the discount code so you folks can save some cash. It looks like a couple of you did ask what I'm cooking for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is weird for me because I grew up cooking or eating my grandmother's food and she never let me cook. She never let me help. And I wasn't even that interested in cooking Thanksgiving food. I looked at it as kind of like something that your family makes and something that's kind of like tradition tested. and. A lot of it is kind of bought and packaged and it doesn't hold a lot of technique, but then of course there's enough people on the internet and across publications that take Thanksgiving to a whole nother level. But what changed for me was when I moved to Europe and when I was living in Norway, Thanksgiving wasn't a thing. It was this thing that some people kind of did, Norwegians kind of did it just to feel American in a sense. At Least for Kit, we were from 14 different countries and it was myself and my roommate were the only two Americans. So we took it upon ourselves to make a big Thanksgiving spread for staff meal on Thanksgiving every single year. And that was my first time doing Thanksgiving on my own, essentially. And I was able to take all my cooking experience and channel it, like laser beam it at a Thanksgiving meal. And it was always super, super fun because it was always also like, I got to outsource some of these projects where I would say to a Norwegian kid or some dude from Spain that's never made this food before, I want you to make this thing called stuffing. And I would always, of course, do like the sweet potatoes with marshmallows as well to just blow everybody's mind. Everybody thought that was the coolest thing ever. Now that I'm back in the US, Anna and I always like hosting people. We are flying my dad out here and there's a couple stragglers of friends of ours here in Seattle that we're just gonna have over. And I think it's like seven or eight of us. It's gonna be super small, but I do all the trimmings. So I do the steak, the dressing, sweet potatoes, mashed potatoes. I do uh, fermented and then fried Brussels sprouts. That's something I really fell in love with doing at Norway. Um, kale salad. And then we have people bring pies and wine and we just sit around and have a good time. Luis asks, Justin, what chef's knife would you recommend for daily use under $150? I think that Misono, Togiharu, uh, Kikuchi, all really, really good options, especially in that price range. You can get one of their higher end lines. As with most of my knife recommendations, I would love to recommend one single knife, but it's different for everyone. So I recommend going into a shop that you respect, that you know that will steer you in the right direction 
getting a feel for like what is available at your budget. They're usually pretty good about recommending something like that. Ryan Delos Santos says, aspiring entrepreneur chef who is trying to start a catering business stationed in Hawaii. Any tips on beginning my journey? Catering especially is different from restaurants in the way that it's centered around relationships and your network as opposed to like hype or media attention because you can be the best caterer in town, but you're way better off being the caterer that has a really, really strong list of those like five to 15 clients that continuously call you back every single time they need food. I recommend you listen to my podcast episode I did with Jade Leong. She goes into all sorts of details on like how to send that first email to a client and how to conduct yourself in a professional way and what to look for when you're hiring people. I think what you really need to focus on is making sure that your first and second and third and fourth and fifth event go really well and you set it up in a way where they wanna call you back next time because that cash flow will make sure that you can continue to grow your business and get better and better and better clients. Trey Ballara says, there are very few videos who actually give chefs tips slash advice since you're, you have such a good experience, you should do that more often. I struggle with that sometimes because as much as I love doing the advice-based videos and I love the coaching calls that I have with you folks, YouTube doesn't favor that because you aren't technically searching some of the topics that I discuss in those videos. And there, because there aren't other people on YouTube doing those things, I can't piggyback off of anybody else's uh, views on their videos where you have like the little sidebar that recommends people. So in order to get that organic reach, sometimes I have to go with what is trendy. And that means like the gear reviews and knife reviews, those are by far my most uh, viewed and engaging videos. So I ride the line with making sure that I'm producing valuable and meaningful content for my audience, which is you folks, but then also making sure that I'm setting myself up to gain that awareness through other people and other avenues. But thank you, I appreciate that. I, I am very aware that I'm creating a new category and I also wanna be the best in that category. So it means a lot. Jay asks, just wondering if you could talk about your time in Michelin starred restaurants and what that experience was like. I highly, highly, highly recommend that anybody who hasn't gotten experience in a Michelin star restaurant, if you're ambitious and you want to build something that is bigger than, you know, something that's more casual, I highly recommend doing a Michelin star stage at the least. If you can spend like a year somewhere where you can really build those relationships and see what the inner workings looks like, because going from a place that doesn't have Michelin status to one that does, at least in my experience, has been a total drastic difference based on like, their professionalism and the way that they dress and the way that they set up the station and the way that the food comes in and is stored and is prepped, it's all different. And regardless of whether or not that's your ambition, I think you should see what that side looks like, right? So I think about like, even if you want to be like a jazz bassist in a band that just plays in amazing bars all across the country, I think that it would benefit you to see what it looks like to organize a big symphony and maybe you can cherry pick some of those things that you really enjoy and apply them to what you're interested in. And I think that there are a few industries where you can have access to these people that are operating at a very, very high level, like we can uh, in the chef realm, right? Like if I'm a computer programmer, I can't just go hang out at Google for a day in their product development teams where I can see exactly what they're working on. That would take a t t like either an amazing network or something like a connection or you know some crazy opportunity where I'm interviewing for a job. But with kitchens, you can just go in and hang out and see what's going on and then take what you need and move on. All right, Stephen, my very, very long question. You wanna know under $600, chef knife, 50-50 bevel, right-handed, great steel. Go with the Ninox, man. I mean, the Ninox has a great profile, great steel. The weight is great, at least for my opinion. The spine is amazing. Um, if you're gonna go with a Kramer, I haven't used a Kramer. I feel like the people who like Kramers just love Kramers, uh, only because the handle shape is just so different. So I don't know what your hand shape is like, but from what you're saying and looking at your budget, I think you could actually get in touch with a custom knife maker and see if they can make something for you. There are a lot of people who, you know, at that price point, you could probably get a really nice like nine inch chef knife custom made for you. It seems like you're already super into knives, so I wouldn't discourage you from going that route, but I don't think you can go wrong with an Enox at all. Underscore Faro underscore asks, what dishes do you think kids can prepare easily? I think kids just like being involved. It's kind of like a weird mad science experiment when they're seeing like pots boiling and things sizzling and you're using like this sharp thing to cut things and you're mixing things. I think any stage, age of course is dependent here, 
If you're talking about, you know, like a four-year-old compared to an 11-year-old, they're very, very different. I think that uh, we are the generation, at least my generation, I'm 26, the generation where our parents went through this revolution of having packaged food and convenience. So like my mom doesn't really know how to cook that well. So it's fascinating that I didn't get that knowledge coming up. And so I think anything that we can do to instill that at least like a curiosity in kids is really really good um and of course like stick to the things that they eat within reason i think it's fascinating that when my brother was super super little he <laughs> my mom would always think it was so crazy that sometimes he would cook things with me that he never would eat if he like if he got it either at a restaurant or if my mom made it but because he had a hand in helping prepare it that made him that much more interested and he felt ownership of it so he wanted to then eat it and i think that's really really cool with kids where that reverse psychology can work in your favor dr muid cullen i hope i pronounced that right asks uh can i explain how i made my curved spatula and how it helps compared to a fish spatula one second Correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think they're asking the difference between this, my De Hella Ren uh, spatula that I bent myself, and then this, which is just like a traditional fish spatula. When I was at Per Se, it was very looked down upon to use these. It was seen as utilitarian. It was seen as kind of being messy and not having any sort of finesse when you're working with the fish. Now that I'm kind of removed from that, I see where this can be used delicately and thoughtfully. I don't hate this, but because of that mindset, I take a look, took a look at, uh, you know, the spatulas that are sometimes a little bit longer than this and a little bit wider. And I wanted something that could fit in my bane that would also be good to use on the, you know, like the 150 gram pieces of fish that we were cooking at the restaurant. What I got frustrated with, with the straight ones is that I always had to kind of like get my fingers dangerously close to the hot pan to get underneath the fish. And what I got mad with, with the offset ones was they would always bend in a weird way that was never really, the angle wasn't ever really right for the fish. So the thing that I like about this is that it curves and it has different degrees of angle. So you can push down if you really want and get underneath a piece of fish. You can go this way, which is great for getting underneath like stuck pieces of, we, we used to do like pork snout and uh, pork ears at the restaurant. And so when those stick to the pan, you can flip it down on the other side and get underneath it in a great way. I really wanted to show an example, but I couldn't seem to find it. This is the closest thing that I can find. This is a different kind of steel that's way more flexible. And what I tried doing with something like this was actually heating it over an open fire right here and then seeing if I could bend it in a way that made sense. But you can see that like it bends here and it's going to start to feel and it, it doesn't stay. So you need the higher, this is like an Enox quality steel, which is really, really nice. And you basically just need to bend it and continue to work it, continue to press it. There's nothing fancy involved here. I didn't put it in a mold or anything or a brace. And you just need to continue to bend it, bend it, bend it, and get that core steel bent until it's ready to go. I love this. I use it all the time. It's my favorite. Emily Frederick says, it would be a great video to show how to effectively use your recipe book, as in how to take good notes and how to best set it up. As I've said with most of my other videos, I think it's great to show that you're writing things down, not only because it makes so much sense in the moment when you'll probably forget things later, but also to show that you are interested in those minute details. And during that process, I wanna make sure that you're like asking questions, but I think, I think everybody organizes themselves visually differently. I would hate to suggest that my way is the best way, but for me, I just need to you have two things very separate. The numbers, as far as like the weight and the amount and the quantity, and then the method, they're both separate. So you eventually get to a point with a recipe when you don't necessarily have to look at the method anymore. As long as you know that it's this amount of oil to this amount of eggs to this amount of mustard, you can probably make a mayo. I also think that speed is super important. That's why I'm re a really big fan of making things digital, keeping them on my phone so that I can search through them super quickly. If you are someone that learns and remembers things better by physically writing them down, I want you to do that. Gerald Pa asks, any gear related videos in the works. Yes, I'm working on two right now. One is a review of the Finex cast iron uh, pot. And then the other one is a what's in my Pelican video, which was requested after I posted on Instagram that I finally found the perfect basics Pelican for all of my pop-ups and events. Lou G, I'm currently a student here at CIA Singapore. So glad I found your channel. Any tips for those, those of us working in culinary school? What are your, what was my biggest takeaway from my time there? I really need to do a is culinary school worth it style video. Biggest thing for me as someone who 
Lewis coming from basically not working in any restaurants at all to going to a very prestigious culinary school was just getting my feet wet and making sure that I was taking advantage of all the opportunities that were available to me. So that means any relationships that your school has with specific restaurants, make sure you use that as a foot in the door to gain that professional network. And then also like, if your colleagues aren't gonna help you, like your peers, if your peers, you, you're seeing that they aren't gonna necessarily be the best people to hang around with, make friends with your instructors. Their networks are vastly larger than yours. And also keep in mind that you're essentially paying to mess up. So I'm thinking about like station organization, burning things, uh, trying out things in different ways. With a couple of exceptions, you're not gonna get quote unquote fired from culinary school in the same way that you would if you were to mess up at a restaurant. So take that into consideration and make sure that you're learning as much as possible. King Grizzly, hey Justin, I'm in culinary school. My knife skills aren't up there. I'm having trouble doing things with my Shun Premier Chef knife that I wouldn't have a problem doing with a Global or a Wusthof. That's kind of weird. I don't know if the knife just isn't sharp or if the way that it's sitting in your hand is uncomfortable to cut in certain ways. I have a problem blaming the gear. Um, and that's something that I'm going to say repeatedly because I don't necessarily think that if you have bad knife skills, if you buy a good knife, it's going to make you have great knife skills. This has been said across industries, whether it's like just because you have a better paintbrush doesn't mean you're going to be a better painter or a better guitar won't make you a better musician. I would much rather see that you're interested in improving your skills with what you have, whether that's like getting better at sharpening or uh, timing yourself on how long it takes you to blast through like a kilo of potatoes in Brunoise. This is some tough love coming from me. It's probably not the gear, it's probably you. Crystal asks, any advice on how to become a leader amongst your peers? I became a chef assistant recently, which is basically like a shift leader at work. Blah, 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 blah. Long story, how do you balance your workload? How do you speak to your peers without hurting their feelings that I cannot help them? You have to understand that everybody in a kitchen has a specific role. That's why the brigade exists. Yes, the poissonnier could probably help the entremet station, but does that mean that they should? I think another common problem that happens is sometimes you'll be seen like on your phone emailing a purveyor or you'll be seen writing on a clipboard. And because it's not this like brute grunt work of like either being elbow deep in a cambro mixing something or like chopping onions or standing over a stove, it's seen as not working as hard. What's funny though, is that because you have the responsibilities, you are making sure that you're setting up that person to do their job as effectively as possible. And I don't know whether that's communicating to them like, hey, this is how I'm helping you be more effective. And maybe it's an issue of making sure that they feel acknowledged for the work that they're doing, whether it's making sure that you're saying, setting goals and then showing that they're achieving them, and whether it's time related or production related. It sounds like you're in something like a Tornot role and Tornant is basically someone that has the freedom to bounce around to any station and help out in whatever way is possible. And the best way to go about that position is to make sure that you're communicating with your higher up and making sure that they're instructing you. Because otherwise you're going to feel in, pulled in all different directions because people are lazy and they're going to take help where they can get help. Another thing that I would advise is to make sure that you're keeping that awareness of the kitchen to make sure, because your job as you scale outside of just the line is to have a more big picture view, not just like what's going on on my station with my dishes, but seeing everything else. And if you can work on generating that confidence of saying, no, you're gonna be okay. This other person really needs help though. I think that's gonna help a lot. Rico Reyes asks, any books that I would recommend that are easy to read and affordable? I think you need to go with the topics that are interesting you at the moment. If, if you're really interested in fermentation and pickling, get the new Noma book. If you really want to read about vegetables, get something by like Michelle Bra. Instead of advising you to get something that's easy to read, I would rather you pursue something that's maybe a little bit more difficult to read, but it's because you're so passionate about the subject, you're interested in picking it up and making the effort to absorb that knowledge. That is going to do it for questions. I think I got to most of them. Leave a like down below if you want to see me do this a little bit more often. I'm thinking maybe with this feature, I can do it once monthly to make sure that any questions you have get answered. Like I said earlier, I'm a huge fan of keeping this all contained inside YouTube. I can ask the question on YouTube, publish the video to YouTube, and then interact with the comments on YouTube. If you get any value from the content that I put out there, I would love your support on Patreon. If you can swing it, that is over at patreon.com slash Justin Kana. Would love for you to make this thing that I do here a little bit more sustainable. And if you're doing any Black Friday shopping coming up, I just did a few small tweaks and a couple large tweaks on all of my kits over at kit.com slash Justin Kana. Should you decide to cop anything based on my recommendations, I do get a small kickback from that. That does help support the channel at no extra cost to you. Of course, as always, I really appreciate your attention. My name is Justin Kana. Have a good one and happy Thanksgiving.